It's Wednesday, September 6. In the headlines in local news, an update on back-to-school reports from the Education Minister. In business news, Jamaica to draw down IMF funds for debt refinancing. Regionally, Guyana's unemployment rate further declines. Internationally, former Proud Boys leader sentenced to 22 years for capital riot. And in sports, national netballer to receive a new home. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Brittany Clark. A member of parliament is elected to represent the interests of the constituents who elected him or her as well as the interests of the nation through the added ministerial responsibilities given. But what are those interests and how should they go about it? Also, how should they be assessed? It is with those and other questions in mind that a series of town hall meetings are being held. This was agreed on Tuesday during a joint select committee meeting examining the green paper regarding job descriptions for MPs and the codes of conduct for parliamentarians and cabinet ministers. Member of Parliament for Southwest St. Elizabeth and committee member Floyd Green encouraged the young people to provide feedback throughout the process. So I also want to suggest, Chair, that I, I know that some we have called the names of some organizations. There are a number of youth-led organizations or secondary schools council. I, I think it would be good to specifically reach out to them to ask for them to give some feedback on these job descriptions. Right? We hope a number of them will transition from student leadership into political representation. So it would be good to hear from them. The first meeting is set for September 24 at Jamaica College. It will cover constituents in Kingston, St. Andrew, St. Catherine, and St. Thomas. So it would be the, what date we're looking at? Saturday is the 23rd and Sunday. Sunday the 24th? Yes. Right. And we're thinking, JC? So I would say Kingston, St. Andrew, I'd like to include St. Thomas, Thomas and St. Catherine. And possibly St. Catherine. Mr. Green also made suggestions for localized consultations within constituencies. We probably also could formally write to the MPs encouraging them to have their own sort of localized consultation to get some feedback to give to the committee, those who deem it necessary, because it might be good for members of parliament to have a sit down session to hear. Because again, the, the information about, remember we have a working document. So saying to the people that this is what has been put forward is important, is as much as important as hearing from them, right? Because in what we've put forward, it may be changing some of the narratives about what to expect. Meanwhile, committee member and MP for East Rural St. Andrew, Juliet Holness, said the public engagement series is a step towards removing public perception that politicians cannot be transparent, accountable and judicious. And I take issue with us always seeming to be in a place that we behave as if we're the worst of the worst and we continue to feed the narrative in everything we do and say and how we conduct our affairs. We must hold ourselves in high esteem and regard, and this process is actually a part of doing that, saying to the people, we are opening up ourselves to you, we want your input, and we want to be held accountable. In June, Prime Minister Andrew Holness tabled in the House of Representatives job descriptions for parliamentarians in the form of a green paper, and for ministers, a white paper. Mr. Holness said the move was intended to improve public perception regarding roles and responsibilities of ministers and members of parliament. Minister of Education Favel Williams says principals from across the education regions have reported a satisfactory start for the first day of the new school year. Most schools started the new academic year on Monday, September 4. She gave an update during Wednesday's post-cabinet press briefing. Carla Thomas-Hewitt has that story. It will be another week before schools fully reopen as some high schools are still conducting orientation of students. However, Minister Williams is encouraged by the reports so far. Based on um, the checks that we have done, 
um, in, in terms of the start of the school year, uh, it seems to have been going smoothly. Yes, we know that not all our students are back yet or our teachers are back in the classroom because traditionally it's our primary schools that tend to come back more fully, even though now we're seeing some of our private schools, I mean, some of our primary schools stagger the students coming back, meaning they will bring back uh, the grade six cohort uh, like we saw at Windward Road Primary School. Um, but we are seeing students come back and more students as the days go by. Um, traditionally, in our high schools, they have also staggered um, simply because their, orient their orientation sessions uh, tend to be more intensive with students and parents. Uh, but we fully expect that as we go through the week and into next week, that we will see the full cadre of students and the teachers back in the classrooms. Minister of Education and Youth, Fable Williams, says the number of students who sat the Caribbean Secondary Education Examination are almost in line with those before the COVID-19 pandemic. She gave the report on those numbers and grades during Wednesday's post-Cabinet press brief. Overall, we are better in 2023 than where we were in 2019 post-pandemic in terms of the number of students registering for the CSEC. And that is a very good trend. If you look at the overall numbers, we are almost just a smidgen under where we were post-pandemic. And you're also seeing the decline into the pandemic, but you're seeing the recovery out of the pandemic. She says there is a slight recovery in grades for information technology and mathematics. The gray one is info technology. We're pretty much, it's been pretty much a good performance in information technology, not a lot of uh, decline, uh, slight recovery this year versus last. Uh, if you look at mathematics, you could see um, that we declined into the pandemic, but there is good recovery out of it if you look at this year versus last year. Looking at CAPE, the number of registrations are not yet back to normal. And we are seeing recovery there, 23 versus 22, but we're not back yet where we were um, uh, pre-pandemic. If you move to the next slide, looking at the public subject entries, again, the same, same pattern, recovery, but not quite back yet to where we were, were um, pre the pandemic. Minister Williams also gave an analysis regarding the grades, with slides showing more than 35,000 students getting satisfactory grades, either at grade one or two, in at least one subject and about 30,000 earning general passes. There is recovery, uh, 23 versus 22. Uh, in, in a lot of areas, we are back uh, where we were prior to the pandemic, but in some, we still have um, some, uh, some recovery to go. The education minister says the breakdown will be made public in due time. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carla Thomas Hewitt. Plans are being made to widen the category of offenses for which individuals convicted for crimes in the past can receive expungement. Expungement is having a conviction removed from one's criminal or police record after a specific period of time has elapsed and after certain requirements have been met. The statute which authorizes the expungement of criminal records is the Criminal Records Rehabilitation of Offenders Act of 1988. The principle underlying this provision is that a person who has made a sincere and successful attempt to be law-abiding should be given the opportunity to start afresh without being haunted by an unfortunate past. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck told the Jamaica Observer, quote, 
the MOJ is proposing to widen the categories of offenses that will be available for expungement so persons who have completed their sentence and live a lengthy crime-free period in the community should be eligible for expungement, unquote. Time now for the Business Report with Danida Rodney. Jamaica is set to draw down 255 million US dollars in loans from the International Monetary Fund IMF under the Resilience and Sustainability Facility with the money to be steered towards refinancing high interest debts coming to maturity shortly. The funds, while not yet accessed, were made available after the IMF board expressed satisfaction with the progress that has been made to strengthen the country's resilience to the physical and fiscal impacts of climate change. For your market updates, in foreign exchange trading for Tuesday, September 5, the US dollar sold for an average of $155.32. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $114.35. The pound sterling traded for $195.23. And the euro sold for $165.08. In GSE trading, the GSE index declined by over 1,935 points. The junior market index advanced by over 26 points. The combined market index declined by over 1,567 points and the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by over 512 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 105 stocks of which 37 advanced, 50 declined and 18 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Viable Preference, Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Trading firm were Consolidated Bakeries Jamaica Limited, Apple Limited 7.75% Preference Shares, and Everything Fresh Limited. The overall volume leaders were Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 600,000 units, Wickton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares, and Sagicor Select Funds Limited Financial with over 500,000 units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Zero Securities traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Gutted Enterprises Limited was the sole security trading over 5,000 shares. In regional business, Trinidad and Tobago Central Bank Governor Dr. Alvin Hilaire believes there is an urgent need for regulation clarity as it pertains to cryptocurrency and the central bank is moving that regulatory process forward, Sunilala reports. Speaking at a panel discussion on issues related to crypto assets, Central Bank Governor Dr. Alvin Hilaire stated that inaction is not an option. What we are saying now, at least at the central bank, there's urgent need for regulatory clarity. If you do not have clarity, you will not be able to move forward. You will not be able to, to promote the industry while having good investor protection. We need to do that very quickly. Dr. Heller said there's great uncertainty around the world regarding the use of cryptocurrency, explained the El Salvador experience, which has accepted it as a legal tender, while China has banned it altogether. He noted that a large majority of the local population are concerned about the risk associated with cryptocurrency, adding this is why the central bank will embark on a public education drive and a further move to develop an appropriate regulatory framework in this area. This is what we want, we want to do. By the end of October, continuing with, with the discussion with, with you guys and, and uh, etc., we will be able to prepare something to set to, to the to the Minister of Finance in our capacity as, as um, uh, our legal capacity as advisor on, on financial uh, legislation. And the Chief Executive Officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Securities and Exchange Commission, TTSCC, Lystra Lucilio, said while people might be interested in cryptocurrency, there's very little activity locally. So generally, within the world, they saw that Trinidad and Tobago had very little activity when it came to this. So persons might be interested, but you're not seeing 
a large percentage of persons investing what they have in cryptocurrencies. She said the TTSEC is launching its own impact assessment on cryptocurrency and will start to build its own regulatory framework. Sonolala, TTT News. In international business, U.S. stocks closed lower, pressured by rising treasury yields and oil prices as investors assess prospects for the Federal Reserve's interest rate path. The Dow shed more than half a percent, the S&P 500 lost four-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq dipped marginally. While all three stock indexes logged gains last week on hopes for a less hawkish Fed, that sentiment has somewhat faded this week. U.S. Treasury yields rose after factory orders fell less than predicted, and Fed Governor Christopher Waller said it suggests that the central bank need not change rates anytime soon. Rob Hayworth, Senior Investment Strategy Director at U.S. Bank Wealth Management, said this continues to make bonds a solid alternative to stocks. If you need your, your portfolio to grow at 5% a year, you can do that by owning treasuries. Great. Right. That, that's a simple, safe thing to do. You don't have to be subject to the day to day volatility of the equity market, which, as we were all reminded in 2022, can still be large. And U.S. crude prices continued to rally on Tuesday, dampening the Fed's efforts to push inflation back to 2 percent. Of the S&P's 11 major sectors, energy was the biggest gainer, closing up half a percent after hitting a roughly seven-month high. Saudi Arabia and Russia earlier announced a fresh extension to their voluntary supply cuts. In company news, shares of United Airlines lost 2.5 percent after falling nearly twice as much earlier in the day, with a system-wide information technology issue forcing an hour-long aircraft ground stop. And shares of Airbnb rallied 7 percent, while Blackstone added roughly 3.5 percent on news that their stocks would join the S&P 500 index. In market days before oil, oil prices reversed course after rising over 1 percent in the previous session on a firmer dollar and as investors shrug off jitters arising from supply cuts from Saudi Arabia and Russia. Brent crude futures were down 59 cents to $89.45, while West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures traded at $86.21 a barrel, down 48 cents. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, in the Bahamas, Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Michael Darville says with 52 confirmed cases of dengue, officials are increasing fogging around the island. More in this report. Darville telling reporters ahead of the weekly cabinet meeting that there are now cases confirmed on Grand Bahama. I believe we have three confirmed cases in Grand Baham with the possibility uh, of an admission if that's not the case or maybe two and uh, we are upping our uh, investigation and uh, fogging as well as uh, in, uh, going from door to door with those cases that we do find to ensure that we make sure the environment is protected so there's no increased breeding. A few weeks back, officials revealed there was a suspected case in Abaco. Darville says that case turned out to be negative. He adds the data revealed only serial type 3 was found in the Bahamas. There are currently 52 confirmed cases of dengue in the country. The health minister is reiterating the need for residents to be vigilant. We are once again telling the Bahamian people to look at your surroundings, ensure that you don't have no buckets of water lying around that can cause a growth of the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. We're up uh, fogging, but of course fogging only knocks what's airborne. And if you have these uh, receptacles filled with water around a home you continue to breed, uh, that is concerned. So the Department of Environmental Health is working very closely with the ministry uh, to really get the message out. A new report from the Inter-American Development Bank has found that Guyana's unemployment rate is declining as inflation remains moderate. More news from Newsroom Guyana. Unemployment rates are on the decline as the economy continues along its upward trajectory, poised to catapult development to new heights. In a new report from the Inter-American Development Bank, Guyana has also been hailed for its efforts in balancing inflation rates with gross domestic product growth for this year, now pegged at 
In its carbon economies, at a crossroads report, the bank notes that Guyana's high-rate economic growth, driven by a growing oil production sector, has played a major role in unemployment rates declining and access to finance for the private sector improving. The unemployment rate declined from 15.6% in 2021 to 14.5% in 2021. Driven mostly by declines in the unemployment rate of men, which dropped to 12% in 2021 compared to 18.4% for women. The International Labour Organization estimates further declines in the unemployment rate in 2022 falling to 12.4%, 11% for men and 14.4% for women, the report states. While there have been persons claiming that they are unemployed, the government has consistently said that not only is Guyana on a trajectory of constant growth that would provide even more high-paying jobs, but the current economic growth has already opened up enough jobs for the number of people unemployed. In fact, there have been constant reports of more jobs being available than can be filled locally, leading to discussions about importing labour. Meanwhile, Guyana's gross domestic product growth is expected to grow by an additional 37.2% in 2023 with the arrival of the third floating production storage and offloading vessel, FPSO. As the government prioritizes the diversification of resources, heavy investments in non-oil and sustainable sectors such as agriculture saw the non-oil economy growing by 11.5% in 2022. The sector is expected to grow by an additional 7.9% in 2023. Barbados' Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley has warned that doing nothing or not enough on climate change is hurting countries as it knows no borders. In a virtual address, she told fellow leaders attending the ongoing Africa Climate Summit of 2023, hosted by the African Union, the world is not moving at a pace nor scope necessary to tackle the environmental decline to secure the planet. We can continue to talk amongst each other, seeking perfection or even casting blame, while the world literally burns. Or we can choose to transform our future. We can choose to shape it. To do so, we've said all along, we need to take action now, and at the pace and the scope that matters. And why with such urgency? We now live in a world of superlatives. I call it the season of superlatives, the hottest, the rainiest, the warmest. Everything is breaking new barriers and new records for the Guinness Book of World Records. And yet every day we continued to do nothing or enough as we see the impacts of the climate crisis. We need to stop talking and we need to do. Only because we live in a world where capitalism and money dominate so much that unless we unlock the financing mechanisms, we're not going to be able to take the necessary action at scale and with speed. At its core, the Bridgetown Initiative sets out how we can rebuild the international financial architecture to be fit for purpose, so that countries like ours and yours are no longer disadvantaged by systems that were not built with us in mind when they were established. Now is the time to do what needs to be done. There's no other word. In international news, the former leader of the far-right group, the Proud Boys, has been sentenced to 22 years in prison for his part in directing the January 6 attack on the U.S. Capitol in 2021. Enrique Tarrio's sentence is the longest for any case connected to the assault. More from Al Jazeera. Prosecutors say Enrique Tarrio was the top commander of the far-right extremist group that on January 6, 2021, saw itself as Donald Trump's army. Tarrio was not physically present at the riot that delayed the congressional certification of Joe Biden's win. But prosecutors say Tarrio orchestrated the attack, recruiting lieutenants, monitoring the assault, and privately telling others later, make no mistake, we did this. Tario served a four-month jail sentence in 2022 for another offense, telling reporters on his release that he was unrepentant for January 6th. But some of the guys that are in there for the J6 stuff, they're going to be in there for a while. They're political prisoners. And I'm more worried about them than I was worried about myself. That tune changed after Tario's May trial, in which a federal jury convicted Tario and three other Proud Boys leaders of seditious conspiracy. 
Tario told the sentencing judge on Tuesday that January 6th was a national embarrassment and said the trial had humbled him. The judge gave Tario 22 years, the longest of any Capitol riot conspirator. While we respect the judge's sentence, uh, we respectfully disagree, and but yet we respect it. Uh, there will be a day and a time where an appeal will come, and we expect that the appeal to come soon. Tario flashed a victory or peace sign as federal marshals led him away to prison. Another Proud Boys leader who'd been sentenced last week said he hoped Trump would become president again and pardon him. Here there was a serious attempt to stop the peaceful transfer of power and it's a hallmark of American democracy. And I think there's a lot of concern among government officials, especially with President Trump out there still screaming about election fraud, that we have a new, another presidential election coming up in 2024 and we want to make sure that we don't see a repeat of 2020. The U.S. Justice Department has charged more than 1,100 January 6th rioters and says it continues to make new arrests. Heidi Jo Castro, Al Jazeera, Washington. In sports, national netball player Latanya Wilson will be receiving a new house from the government this week. This after fire destroyed her family home two weeks ago. The government has also revealed plans to provide all players and members of the Sunshine Girls coaching staff for the recent Netball World Cup and members of the CAC Games gold medal winning team with financial rewards. Led by a fine all-round performance from Sophie Devine, Guyana's Amazon Warriors defeated Trinbago Knights Riders by 21 runs in the Massey Women's Caribbean Premier League at the Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad on Tuesday. A victory for the Guyana Amazon Warriors women over Trinbago Knight Riders in the Massey Women's Caribbean Premier League. It's a massive one in the context of the competition because both teams came into this match looking for their first win after they lost all their games on the previous leg in Barbados. Batting first, the Ghana Amazon Warriors, they were in a very good position at 106 for two by the end of the 15th over, and then they fell away for 132. Sophie Devine, she made 48, Stefani Taylor 32, but the rest of the batting really withered away on this wicket here at the Queen's Park Oval. Bowling for the Trinbago Knight Riders, the hometown girl Anissa Mohammed, 4 for 28, and Mary Kelly, 4 for 30. Now, Trinbago Knight Riders, they were looking for 133 four victory here which would have kept them alive in terms of getting a spot in that final against the Barbados Royals on Sunday at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. They were in the contest uh, very deep into it but then they lost towards the back and especially when DeAndre Dutton was dismissed. They eventually made 111 for 9 from their 20 overs with Dutton playing her first match of the tournament getting 35 and Kizia Knight getting 19. Top bowling effort from the Guyanese, uh, the Guyana Amazon Warriors that is. Uh, Shubman Ishmael 2 for 29, Sophie Devine 2 for 27, but Shriya, Shriyanka Patel and the home girl Karishma Ramharak combining for 4 for 31 from their 8 overs and those really put the tighten the screws really on the Trinbago Knight Riders. After the game we spoke to Shriyanka Patel, she's all the way from Bangalore. She followed up her two wickets here, uh, four wickets sorry in the previous game with two here and she's clearly enjoying conditions in the Caribbean. Yeah, at the halfway stage, you thought you had it up 132? So, when we had 132 on the board, we kind of thought that we are going to get the job done because we knew that our bowling attack is amazing. So, we knew, we knew that we were going to get our job done. Yeah. And after looking how uh, you guys batted in terms of how TKR bowled, what do you think was key for when you guys bowled? So, I had a quick chat with all the bowlers. Uh, so, myself and Ramarak had a quick chat around how the wicket is working on now because it was very slow and there was some turn for us. So, we thought that if we can use them, it's going to uh, make a big impact. Right, you got four wickets in the last game too. Now, you seem to be enjoying conditions here. Yes, so pretty well because uh, I love bowling on turning track and I'm enjoying it. Right. What does this mean for you guys now, a victory here and you still remain in the competition? Yeah, so we just wanted this victory because we've been doing really well. It's just that we're missing by a small batter. So we're doing well and uh, I think next match also we need to put up a big show. The Massey Women's Caribbean Premier League will continue tomorrow right here at the Queen's Park Oval with Trinbago Knight Riders versus the Barbados Royals who are unbeaten in their three games so far and they're already through to Sunday's final. Then the competition continues on Saturday 
which the Guyana Amazon Warriors coming up against the Trinbago Knight Riders that's at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy and of course there is a final on Sunday at the same venue. Reporting for Newsroom from the Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad, I'm Avanar Framzai. That's news on PBCJ. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thanks for watching.